that there are some copies of Elif's latest book, The Three Daughters of Eve, available, and people who ask questions will be given a copy. <laughs> That's your incentive. There you go. Um, <laughs> So, would you prefer a, a bunch of questions or one one? Um, either way, either way, you decide. You could do either way. Um, let's start taking individual ones. I, I'm going to I'm going to start with this gentleman over there, just because your hand shot up first, yeah. and then I'm going to go to the gentleman in the back and this young woman here in the front. Mm. Hi, my name is uh, I'm a journalist uh, working uh, in Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan. Uh, after the Taliban regime and uh, in the past two decades, we once again we have debate about uh, women's rights and the future and how to go forward. And there is this uh, sort of a debate, it's almost quite, a, a, a quite often internal kind of debate with, with people as to how to go forward. So what we have is we have uh, our own traditional values for women where we have a place in the public but then that uh, has limitation when you put it on the international stage in terms of you know, equality, mm. etc. But then um, if you say, okay, we will go for the, uh, the international modern uh, values promoted by Europeans, uh, then there is a backlash against that, mm -hmm. which is because it, it feels alien and, mm -hmm. uh, and important and, uh, and intrusive. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this, uh, this is a bit of a uh, crisis and confusion and dilemma. You know, what do you say to you know, those people? You know, what's your comment on that? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Do you want to respond to that? No. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen this on maybe social media. There was a, in Turkey on 8th of March, International Women's Day, there was a panel organized with five speakers and one moderator, six people, all of them men. And, and the title of the panel was uh, The Situation of Women in Turkey, or The Situation of, of Women in Our Town. Uh, I'm mentioning this is because I think we definitely need to have more women in these discussions. And not only one type of women, you know, of a certain class, of a certain ethnic group, but a variety of women's voices, dressed up in different ways, some of them wearing headscarves, some of them not wearing. We need to build that culture of coexistence. And I really hear you when you say, um, and, I, and I've heard similar things in my country as well, people saying, you know, feminism is not part of our culture. I, despite the fact that I'm a feminist, I understand the limits of the concept. And to be honest, there are, there are places where I haven't used the word feminism as widely as the word sisterhood. Because when I say sisterhood, it reaches further. And I'm still saying the same thing. You know, it's still gender equality. So we can say it in different ways. We need to have that kind of cognitive flexibility because cultures change. Uh, so I don't want to be rigid about that. But for me, equality is incredibly important. You know, diversity is important. Inclusivity is important. How do we bring more people to the table? And the second thing, if I may add very briefly, I think one of the sad things about our cultures is because politics is so aggressive, so divisive, so polarized, women too are incredibly divided. And when women are so divided, the only thing that benefits from this is patriarchy itself. We might vote for different parties. We might have you know, different worldviews. We might dress up differently. Can we not have a sisterhood? Can we not have you know, things in common? We do have things in common. One of the laws that uh, the present government in Turkey tried to pass a couple of months ago was, um, was a bill legislative bill that made it possible to reduce the sentence of a rapist of a minor if the rapist agreed to marry his victim because then the family owner is saved. You know, that's, that's the law that they were trying to pass and it created, thank God, a, a big backlash from the civil society, different parts of the society and they had to take a step back. But if that backlash wasn't there, it was going to pass. Uh, imagine what that does to the psyche of a rape victim, you know, to be married forcefully to your rapist. So what I'm trying to say is there's a, there's a massive gap between the people who make the decisions and the society. There are amazing women in Afghanistan, in Turkey, in Pakistan, in, in all around the Muslim world, in every area. Women are not silent. 
uh, in academia, in media, in medicine, but there's one field in which women are almost non-existent, and that's politics. You know, local, regional, national politics, we need more women. Definitely, we must encourage women to enter into that process so that we can change the system. And the gentleman there in the back, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Thomas Khan. Turkey has so-called democratically elected government, which is in fact a dictatorship. And the intellectuals are being killed, people are being imprisoned. Even in Europe, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, you've got populist right, which is getting very, very strong. Yeah. And my question is, how do, uh, does the left-wing forces existing in Turkey help to create some form of democracy, a fight for human rights, uh, social justice, and equality for a lot of people. What, what, is the answer? what do you think they should do? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's such an important question and one that I ask myself too. I, I think it's incredibly crucial for us to go beyond our safe zones, beyond our own echo chambers. You know, if all our friends or the people we communicate with throughout the day, think like us, vote like us, speak like us. That's a very narcissistic ex existence, and it doesn't help. Uh, so I'm, I'm very critical of this idea of retreating into a tribe. I think we need to go beyond that, and that's why I make a very clear distinction between people and, and the demagogues. We, we must be very vocal in our criticism of populist demagogues, but at the same time understand that populism is not the cause, it's a symptom of existing problems. And many people have very legitimate concerns, very legitimate anxieties. I might not agree with their anxieties, but that doesn't mean their anxieties are not legitimate. Um, so we need to approach the people, communicate with the people, listen to the people. You know, it's not a hierarchical relationship. We need to engage with people from very different backgrounds and have a narrative that can bring more people into a common ground, a culture of coexistence. This is going to be our massive challenge. Otherwise, it's very easy to retreat into a tribe of like-minded people and just you know, speak to the gallery where everyone already agrees with each other. Our challenge is, can I build a narrative that also means something to people who don't necessarily vote for the left? Can I find a common ground? Can I explain myself that we all need democracy, we all need, you know, we sh there's one thing that worries me, sorry I'm giving long answers, no, but that's the erosion of truth. And when truth is gone, we're all going to be hurt by that. You will remember during the elections in France, uh, it's, it's a very striking example, there's a little video, Macron, he goes to a factory, a fish factory, you know, he's chatting with the workers, and people are cleaning fish. So he just rolls up his sleeves and he starts gutting an eel while he's chatting. And it's because it's a messy job. Afterwards, he looks at his hands, he washes his hands, and he shakes hands with the workers in the factory, and then he goes. So the far right in France have taken this video and they edited the video. The new video, spread by the far right, is shorter, and in the new video there are no fish. There's no eel. In the new video, Macron goes to a factory, shakes hands with the workers, he looks at his hands, he's disgusted because he's just touched a common man, and he goes and washes his hands. Now, this should worry all of us. You might not be a fan of Macron, you don't have to agree with him, but the fact that the truth is being eroded in this way should concern all of us. That's why I'm trying to say we need to go beyond our echo chambers and connect with people and all of us should be alert about this kind of systematic distortion of truth. Uh, do you think NGOs can help in this matter? Who can help? NGOs. NGOs definitely can help, of course, definitely. Because I think the main drive, the main impetus needs to come from the civil society. We live in an age in which, unfortunately, uh, some people might say fortunately, the, the level of trust in, in politicians, politics, uh, the media has, has declined in a very worrying way. And I think the new drive, the new energy, needs to come from us citizens, bottom up, from the civil society. For that, it's very important for NGOs to become engaged, for political groups to become engaged, but also the civil society itself to be more robust and, and more active. 
thank you. And um, this lady here in the front, please. So first of all, thank you so much for this um, beautiful and powerful conversation that we are having right now. Actually, my name is Dorota, yeah. and I'm a research fellow at the Welcome Collection. So yes. I'm working on the uh, project at the Hub, yeah. where we explore the uh, attitudes towards, towards learning disabilities uh, and autism um, together with people with learning disabilities. And you know, some of the issues that we are examining are very much similar to what we've been discussing so far. So for example, the value of difference or what is normal in the society. So I would, just, I would also like to invite you to the house if you have like, you know, five minutes one day. That's we would love to have you there so that you can also contribute you know, your thoughts and ideas towards this project. Yes. Uh, but um, speaking from the academic perspective, my question is really on data. So I love the kind of, um, division that you provided as well, or maybe not division, but kind of compartments in between information, knowledge, and wisdom. So I'm wondering in this area of you know, artificial intelligence, big data, that can sometimes get very controversial as well, um, how data should be collected, or what kind of data should we be collecting so that it contributes more towards knowledge and wisdom as opposed to just increase of information? Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I, I believe that the areas of some conversation topics that we in the liberal left circles haven't thought about as carefully as we should have. And by that, I'm going to give you examples. I think faith is way too important to leave to the religious. Patriotism is way too important to leave to the nationalists. The digital world is way too important to leave to tech monopolies. We need to become involved. And politics is way too important to leave to career politicians. Yeah. So these are the areas I think we need more, more engagement. It worries me a lot, especially after 2012 and 13. It was a turning point because Facebook, um, Google, the way they restructured themselves and they made, it's almost as if they were their advertisement companies now, profit driven, you know? Uh, are they platforms or are they publishers? We need to be careful about all those distinctions. But what worries me precisely is you and I, we might be friends, and you get very different kind of targeted uh, advertisements. I get a very different kind, and we never know what each other is seeing. You know, there's no transparency. That is very worrying, that micro-targeting, big data, all our information, personal information, our relationships, our friendships, what we eat, how we vote, everything is being collected without our knowledge, without our approval, and being used mostly for profit purposes, but also increasingly so for political purposes. And we need to be very aware of, of what is going on. If someone has, let's say, anti-Semitic tendencies, the algorithm catches that and keeps sending more anti-Semitic messages. If someone has is Islamophobic tendencies, again, the algorithm gets that and keeps sending more Islamophobic uh, videos. So, what did they promise us 10 years ago, 20 years ago? They said everyone is going to have an equal voice, a voice, which is wonderful. But what's happening right now is not, not that. People on the fringes who used to be on the margins, they have a disproportionate, yet much more voice than their numbers, beyond their numbers, thanks to the algorithms. Just to give you one example, I, uh, when I was in the States, I would always listen to like, far-right radio commentators and evangelical channels. Um, my friends were very worried about me. <laughs> but the reason I kept listening to these people is because I love the way they use language, metaphors and rich and incredible you know, emotional language and the vocabulary. Anyway, I became addicted and I still listen to these people on YouTube. So much so that my YouTube algorithm thinks I'm a white nationalist, <laughs> you know, young male American man. And when I see what they're watching and I see what they're reading, you know, how the algorithm is making it worse and worse, I really think we need to be very careful about that. We can't be naive about that. And monopolies are not good. We don't want power to be concentrated in the hands of any person. You know, when I think about Turkey, I, I, I never wanted anyone, whether this on this side or that side, to have absolute power, right? That's dangerous. But how do we allow that to happen when it comes to tech companies? You know, they have become monopolies. So I think we need to break that down. It's incredibly important. 
I can, I can really relate to that, actually, because I was also researching the language yeah. of the far right, because it's so, it, so effective, and, and I also got... Yeah, more of them. More yeah. of the... Yeah, I got introduced to a whole load of far right yeah. hate preachers that I'd never heard yeah. of before. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, uh, let's do another round of questions. Um, and, goodness me, um, I would encourage those who don't normally ask questions to ask questions as well. You all know who you are. Um, let's do it. Can we do a round here? So I'll start off with this gentleman here in the front, and I'd like to go after to that woman in the stripy shirt, please. And then we'll go back to this gentleman in the middle. So if we can start with you, sir. Uh, the question is more of a, of a practitioner. Yeah. It's interesting what you're saying. I follow your work and I have to uh, I admire you for it. Thank you. Um, but isn't it also true that you yourself are seen and perceived as an elitist, as an elitist person, because you have, you say the things that you say, which are obvious and very often self evident, but in theory there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. So you move along. You have to carry the country. You have to carry the people. And 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 what in answer to this question of the elite that really scares me, uh, in, in how it is being used and how it's being abused, abused. So therefore, will we have to be like Chomsky and, and go after these guys and then go after the Bukos, go after after the the ones that 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 use very very sophisticated munitions of the mind and dialectics of disinformation. Because what you said about Macron, you, know, you, 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 cannot, you cannot fool all the people all the time, but you can fool some people enough of the time to pass your message. Yeah. E.g. the Pope endorsed Trump for president. That went almost a million retweets. It was enough, among other things, to win the presidency. Yeah. So I do not know, I mean, beyond the observations which are frightfully insightful and correct at the practical level if you have a formula in, in which way you know to go because it, it is really scary. I, I really it, appreciate it. Big, big brother in different ways. Yeah, just, just maybe I really appreciate your question. Um, very maybe briefly I can mention this example and it's also relevant to where we are right now. You will remember the Westminster attack, the terrorist attack in this country, in this city. Uh, do you remember in the aftermath on social media there were pictures of a young woman wearing a headscarf and she was just walking by, not looking at the dead people uh, on the ground and the caption said she doesn't even care, you see. And of course it wasn't true. You know, They had cut the picture, she was calling her family probably to say she was okay. You know, In, in the next scene she was helping people. But even not to retweet that misinformation is an act of active citizenship. You know, there are so many things we can do, small and big. Even not to spread that misinformation is important in our age. Or to say, this is a lie, and just, just to say it aloud. We have to keep an eye on the digital world and how misinformation is being used, misused, and manipulated. Uh, and, it's, and it's quite dark. You know, so there are so many things we, we we can do, each in our own way. I think you know I want to do it through the art of storytelling because this is what I do in life. Someone else in their own way, someone else as a politician, but each and every one of us, I think, it, there are hundreds of choices throughout the day that we can be where we can be more active and engaged in a more progressive way. Even if they are small, they matter. Thank you, and. Um I think it was that lady. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Nelda. I'm a, a student here at King's College. Um, and my question relates to what you earlier said about the engagement of women. Yeah. Um, I found it very interesting that you said that in the Middle East, women are in all professions, but they're not in politics, really. Yeah. And I was wondering why that's the case. I'm, I'm, I'm personally, I'm German, and uh, I know the issues of German women, but I'm also so involved in yeah. German politics. Um, and I, I don't know if it's, if it's the same for the reasons, but um, I, I noticed, for example, in the Arab Spring and also in the Tyson demonstrations, that when women went on the street and claimed the, the, um, the public space, there were also backlashes against them. Yeah. Um, might not be related to whether or not in politics, obviously, but um, I'm, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on the reasons for it. Yeah, 
Thank you so much. I mean, I think Turkey is a very patriarchal society. It's, um, it's very sexist. The, the language we use, and oftentimes we're not even aware of it. We tend to think that the literary world is different because it seems to be more modern, more shiny on the surface. Again, when you scratch the surface, it's just as sexist, just as homophobic as the rest of the society. For instance, when you are a women novelist, you are primarily seen as a woman and then as a novelist. If you happen to be a male novelist, no one talks about your gender. You're a novelist. Uh, so gender is a big criteria. But second thing is age. Patriarchal societies do not respect youth. Yeah? So youth has to wait. They have to wait their turn. That means if you happen to be young and a woman, your life is, will be harder. And I think many women in the Middle East, journalists, writers, academics, we just can't wait to get older. We're trying to age as fast as we can because as years go by, relatively it becomes easier. I see that in my life. When I was young, younger, it was, it was much harder for me. You know, as you age, it becomes... Because we respect the matriarch in the house. We do not, we think old women are not, we don't associate them with sexuality. They're defeminized, they're desexualized in our mind. And then we respect them. Until you get there, you're not respected. <laughs> so it's a long way. Uh, politics is especially hard because uh, of the way it's structured. You know, you have to be, it's, very, it's a society that doesn't see women as individuals on their own. You know, who is your husband? Who is your father, you know, who are you connected to? Do you come from a tribe? What is behind you? That's the way the mentality works. And women always have to shout again and again, I am an individual. So it's very difficult. And we, did, we never had, unlike Spain, for instance, or Portugal to a certain extent, we never had a quota for women. It, it, could, it was never possible in Turkey. So you have to wait for things to change slowly. And it doesn't change. It doesn't go forward. Sometimes it goes backward as we've seen in Turkey. And I think when societies go backwards and when they tumble into nationalism, populism, religious fundamentalism, women should be more worried than men because we have much more to lose. Women and minorities are the first ones that lose their rights. You know? That's how it begins, everywhere. So I think this is a very crucial moment for the world as well, for global sisterhood, for, um, you know, for global support among civil societies. But unfortunately, the system, the political system in Turkey, doesn't encourage more women bottom-up move from the local towards the top in politics. There are not only glass ceilings, but glass walls everywhere. Thanks so much. And the gentleman in the... Um, Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, following the question about uh, women and the issues they are struggling with, uh, especially about the closed uh, society, so much. I find it very important when we look at Facebook users, Twitter users in Turkey, in the Middle East, quite a high number, percentage of them are women and young women. It's almost as if they, they, they're trying to find another public space in the digital world for themselves. And that is important. I never underestimate that. But at the same time, there's so much hate speech, slander, the, the language of sexuality used on social media, the way you're harassed as a woman is, is very different. You know, when you're a woman, you're harassed in a very different way. Um, so it's not an easy world at all. What worries me is, uh, I'll, I'll give you a small example. I go to lots of schools actually in Turkey until recently I used to go. And I would speak with students of different age groups because I also publish children's books. I was able to go to primary schools and have a conversation and book readings with younger kids. So if you go to schools in Turkey, seven-year-old, eight-year-old kids, 
and ask them, is there anyone in this room who would like to become a writer one day? And so many hands go up, you know. Is there anyone who would like to be a poet? Again, hands go up. And the interesting thing is, at that age, girls are just as, if not even more, confident than boys. They're just full of chutzpah, full of imagination, full of confidence. And then I would go to high schools, and everything has changed. Right? They have been socialized through their family, through the education system, through the society. And now when I would ask, is there anyone in this room who would like to become, you know, who wants to be a writer? No hands go up. Nobody wants to be a writer. Nobody wants to be a poet anymore. And the interesting thing is, girls don't speak. They just hold themselves back. This is what we've taught them, to be timid, to be worried about what other people are going to say to them, that they might carry a stigma if they carry their body differently, if they speak up differently. What did we do to these children who were so bold and brave and full of imagination at the age of seven and eight, and I'm looking at them at the age of 14, 15, university, they're not talking anymore. I used to teach in both Turkey and America. In America, you know, I would give readings to my students. They would come back the next week. None of them would have read any of the readings but all of them would be very willing to debate. In Turkey, they would come back, all of them would have read the readings, because if the teacher gives you something, you do it, right? It's, we have the sense of authority. So they would have read the, re the, the manuscripts, but none of them would be willing to speak up, or, and, and, and girls especially more reserved. And after the class is over, they would come and they say, you know what you said didn't make sense, or I wanted to contribute this. But then I would say, why didn't you say it during the lesson? I didn't want to talk. Because we're timid, we become timid. They teach us to be afraid of other people's judgments. And that breaks my heart because this is not how we begin as children. Thanks so much for that. On that note, I'm going to ask the people who are feeling timid to <laughs> please raise your hands. I think what we'll do, because there's so many, if you don't mind, we'll take a, a big round. Of course, of course. Um, of... I'm looking at a sea of male hands that have gone up. <laughs> and I, I mean, I don't, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to draw anything from that, but... We can just say any questions. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with the gentleman here, and then we'll go to the back, go through the back row and come back here. And um, I'll, I'll make a note of what the questions are, because we are running out of time, but I do want everyone okay. to have a go. Yeah. So, if you would like to. Hi, thanks for your amazing talk. I um, apologise in advance for this question. I come across as a bit of a sort of set piece essay type question, but um, I thought I'd give a take on it since I think it's a very apposite time to be asking it in the week that we're in. But um, the question is Is Turkish to Ottoman as English is to British? Interesting. Beautiful question. <laughs> Thank you. And in the back. Yes, I'm a photographer. I'm doing a number of projects in Turkey about the influence and integration of the atmosphere. And I wonder, in 20 years' time, would I be travelling across Turkey photographing Turkish people with portraits of everyone? I'm so sorry, I missed that. Will you repeat it? In 20 years, yeah. Will he be? photographing um, Erdogan in the same way that he's been photographing Ataturk. I see, as okay. A okay. national project. Um, who is the other male hand there? <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, my name is Ayrton Chan. Um, I'm kind of I'm the same emotional group as you. Uh, I was born in Turkey and I live in London, UK. Yeah. And I kind of said some dirty to you. I've mentioned a little bit as well. So for example, Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Who is the other gentleman? That, yes, there we go. Yes, you, sir, in the time. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'll answer your question. I'd like to briefly express that. My name is Conor Hatko. Uh, I'm the organiser of the Cassian and Jacobs events in the UK mm -hmm. and in Ireland. Uh, I've been promoting and preserving my culture as it has a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. and has, it has a lot of similarities with feminism and with women's rights, as it has been our culture for over 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, there's over 8 million North Caucasians living in Turkey today, yep. um, which uh, made us to be considered as the second largest minority. We are considerably one of the most uh, well respected uh, mm -hmm. minority groups in Turkey. However, there's been a lot of issues going on where one North Caucasian, specifically uh, uh, Adiga's Kassim village, has been vandalized by nationalists. And the second problem is. Um, Recently, there has been an outrage by loads of members of our community where Kanade, Kanade, uh, Kanade um, a Tur world popular Turkish TV channel, has uh, a specific Turkish TV show or series where there was a line to demonize Sikassi women where a woman who's very beautiful um, has been dating various men behind this man's back and has been having various children and it hasn't just you know, demonized Sikassi women specifically it has demonized women in general and again this is something to promote sexism in my view. So what would you think um, what, what would you think of the future for minorities and for women in Turkey? Thank so, you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Shall I let you answer that yes. before we I appreciate it. Um, the, the, the journey of the Turkish language is quite interesting. I, I've always been very critical of the Turkification of the language because this was a multi-ethnic, multilingual empire. Mm. And uh, the Ottoman language is quite interesting in the sense that, of course, it's, Turkish is the, is the core. Um, the, the, the structure, the grammar is Turkish, but the vocabulary came from all backgrounds including lots of words from Arabic, Persian, but Ladino as well, Armenian, Greek. And when these words were, um, throughout the Turkification process, when it was initiated, hundreds and hundreds of words have been taken out. To me, it's like a linguistic purge. So when you look at an Ottoman dictionary, it is this thick. A modern Turkish dictionary, it's half the size. Around 55% of the vocabulary is gone. If, um, if I want to say as a writer yellow, I can say it in Turkish and I can say red, but the shades in between used to come from Persian and I don't have those nuances anymore and I long for those nuances. So as a writer, I always use old words and new words because who are we to decide words should not exist? You know, when words live longer than us, their lifespan is longer. Uh, and that was a little bit controversial in Turkey because if you're a liberal, if you're on the left and progressive, why should you be using old words, people would say, you know? I don't like those dualities. Words are for all of us, and they're organic. We should let them live. So when I listen to people speak English, and when they say chutzpah, when they say kismet, and nobody says, wait a minute, that's a Jewish word, let's take it out, that's an Arabic word, let's not use it. Nobody says that. It's organic, it's welcome, it's part of the English language. So there's a sense of continuity in the English language that we did not have in the Turkish language because we had ruptures. And uh, I, I find that also indicative of many other ruptures that we had in our society. But speaking of words, of course, words are heavy in Turkey. Yeah, so why do we not feel comfortable when we are in a taxi and speaking to people? Because we know that um, because of a word, and I think every journalist, every writer, every poet, every academic knows that, because of a poem you've written, because of an article you have penned, because of a novel, because of something you say in an interview, or because of a retweet, you might get into trouble in one day. You know, the next day you might wake up and see the, the papers calling you a traitor, betrayer, pro-government papers attacking. You might see these trolls, organized trolls, at the same time attacking you on social media. You might be sued. You might be detained, arrested, so, or exiled. So there's that knowledge at the back of our minds. And whatever our profession, I think there's a lot of self-censorship in Turkey. 
and that makes us more quieter. There's widespread self-censorship, which is a very difficult subject to talk about because you can talk about the kind of censorship that comes from outside, but how do I admit the kind of censorship that comes from within, that I'm applying to myself? But we must be honest about that too, and I think there is incredible self-censorship today among Turkey's literati. Uh, with regards to minorities, I hear what you're saying. We always demonize minorities through women. And actually, you know, many of us maybe are familiar with the, with the way we learned history in Turkey. One of the phases of the Ottoman Empire is called Kadınlar Sultanatı, which, is, which can be translated as the time of the, as the rule of the women. And we all learned as students in Turkey that that was the time when the women in the harem, many of them were Circassian women, you know, women of different minority backgrounds, they started to interfere in politics and our golden empire went backwards because women, you know, got their hands in, in politics. This is how we learn history. This is how we look at minorities. This is how we look at women. Uh, it is, to me, in a nutshell, the quality of a democracy is not measured by looking at how well the majority is doing, but how well the minorities are doing. And in that regard, the minorities in Turkey, I wish I could tell you that we have made progress. I think it's just the opposite. We have been going backwards and backwards, and many minorities, including the Jewish minority, the Kurdish minority, uh, minorities of all backgrounds, including the Alevis, people don't feel safe. So again, in the public space, it's very difficult to talk about diversity in a country that doesn't see diversity as a positive thing. Um, have we, can we go to another round? Are you, should we take another round of questions? Yeah, I've yeah. Gone, absolutely. All right, so let's do another final one. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start here because you were left over from the last round, so to speak. And then <laughs> the so came out of <laughs> You know what I mean. And then the gentleman behind you in the, in the green cardigan. And then there was a gentleman there. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my name is John, and uh, I'm the son of a mom uh, who was wishing when I was in her womb that I might, I'm going to be a boy instead of a girl. And mm. she, she lived the Turkish story, uh, mm. and, and mm. I grew up with her uh, stories. And I, I read your book, Ashk, of course, uh, when I was growing up with the pink cover yes. that became a <laughs> yes. story on your Twitter as well. Um, I, I, I want to bring up something, uh, a book I'm reading right now, um, and it's about the Indian uh, art of Dharma. Mm. And in terms of, there is just so much cruelty, so much yeah. hate going on. And, and I, I think, I guess, Rumi and uh, Ashk is also bringing this in here as well, about how to solve things uh, with love yeah. uh, in, a, in, in, in a way that, for example, uh, today our justice system is working on punishing the criminal, um, but doesn't care about the victim. Yeah. And this doesn't heal the problem. The, vic uh, the criminal goes to prison, and the victim lives with the pain for the rest of his or her life. Um, and I feel like this polarization of is not sort of, and not reaching out is, I think, just making us fight more. Uh, in a sense, I feel like this Dharma is kind of giving us a clue here about mm -hmm. um, we should give all our resources to f help the victim mm -hmm. instead of um, fighting constant fighting with the person or the concept or the system that's creating the mm -hmm, hate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was curious about your reaction to that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, how do we stay resourced to, to face these overwhelming times so that we don't get overwhelmed? And yeah. I wonder what your experience is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Building on the conversation about uh, rights and conditions of women, yeah. uh, particularly in, in Muslim communities, uh, how do you think Islam, particularly uh, the foundational texts, mm -hmm. uh, Quran and the Hadith, but also our interpretations thereof, uh, influences women's lives? Thank you. Thank you so much. 
All right. Shall we? Would you like to address this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe I start, you know, from flip the last around. question, flip yeah. it around. I think it's a very important conversation, what you're, what you're asking, and at the same time a difficult conversation. Because of the way we've been polarized again, you see Islamophobes on the one hand and people who are extremely defensive on the other hand, and that doesn't help the conversation. There are issues that we need to talk about. If in the majority of the Muslim world there is no practice of gender equality, we need to talk about this. You know, we need to, we need to understand the causes in, a, in an open way, in an open-minded way. But that conversation is very, very difficult. Again, because people, it's because identity is so important and people want to defend their identity vis-a-vis -vis someone else whom they see as attacking their identity, conversations are being closed. And I don't think that's helping us in any way move forward. To me, it's very important that the main drive from majority Muslim cultures comes from the people, from young people, from women, from minorities, you know, from, from the society. But they don't have a voice. There is a hierarchy, you know, people deciding what is the right interpretation. And I want to question that hierarchy. When I look at the history of Islam, uh, I, to, to me it has always been interesting. I've always been interested in heterodoxy, in mysticism. And again, this is very difficult to talk about in Turkey because we are so dualistic in our mind. People say, oh, if you're interested in mysticism, then you must be religious. But if you are a Democrat, if you're a liberal, then you shouldn't be interested in these subjects. Who decides? You know, I, I'm, I'm not a believer. You know, I have to tell you right, right away. I have lots of doubts. I have too many doubts to be a believer. But I am someone who, who is interested in faith. So what troubles me is the certainty, clashing certainties. So when I listen to people who are very sure of their religiosity, the language of certainty, how can you be so certain? Or when I listen to people who are very sure of their atheism, again, I'm puzzled, how can you be so certain? I think I always felt closer to agnostics and to those mystics who were a bit of misfits. They were walking a very thin line between faith and doubt, and they were asking questions. So. Personally, to me, it's much more interesting to see faith and doubt dance. And my problem with rigidly religious people is they want to get rid of doubt. And rigidly atheist people, they want to get rid of faith. Whereas it's much more interesting to let them talk, you know, the dialectics. This is how we make progress. And I think that's why I'm more interested in spirituality rather than organized religious identities, which is not close to my heart at all because I think they all of them are based on a distinction between us versus them, and this assumption that us is closer to God than them. I, I don't like that. But spirituality is very individual. It's our personal journeys. It's, it's very unique, like our fingerprints. And everyone has their own journey. You might start as a believer, you might end up as an agnostic, and I can only respect you. Who am I to judge you? Someone else might do the opposite. Again, I will respect that because that's their personal journey. So these are the areas, you know, more nuanced areas that I think and conversations that unfortunately we haven't been able to develop. Also, I believe, particularly across the Middle East, those other interpretations, more mystical, more humanistic, more universal interpretations have been silenced, suppressed, erased out of our collective memory. And I th that, that is not good either. And many of them are important for women because there was more room for gender equality in those interpretations. Um, it, sorry, I wanted to connect to the second question about you know, how do we overcome these times. To me, it's interesting to see when I look at people who have survived the, the, the biggest atrocities, darkness in human history, like the Holocaust, genocide, civil wars, Almost all of them, particularly the writers who have survived those things, uh, they say something similar. They say bad things happen not because people are bad. Of course there are bad people. There are evil people always. But they're not the majority. And this bad things do not necessarily happen because, because they are bigger in numbers. Terrible things happen when, when the majority of people become numb. So they say the opposite of goodness is not badness. The opposite of kindness is not evil or wickedness. They say the opposite of goodness is numbness, when we become desensitized. 
I think that's a very dangerous threshold. And that is where we are right now, because we're so bombarded with information. And after a while, I don't feel it anymore, do I? You know? Is it, does it, do we register whether it's 5,000 refugees, 500,000 refugees? Do numbers mean anything? We become desensitized. And when numbness spreads, I think that's a fertile ground. And in that ground, you can sow the seeds of racism, sexism, all kinds of you know, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, all kinds of discrimination can flourish in that ground. So I'm very cautious, very careful about numbness. We shouldn't be desensitized. We should not allow ourselves to become desensitized. And for that, we need stories as well, because I think stories rehumanize people who have been dehumanized. So maybe coming back to your question, to me it's incredibly important just that, to have that cognitive flexibility, to shift the angle a little bit. When I learn someone's story, you know, then that other is actually so similar to me. It's my brother, it's my sister, you know, actually the other is me. It's not a faraway category. But for me to be able to make that intellectual and spiritual jump, I need to connect. I need to, be, to, to go beyond that desensitized wall. And these are the things that I worry about, and I think these are the areas where we need more stories and, and the art of storytelling. I feel like that's such a lovely end point that um, maybe we should end with apologies to those who didn't get to ask a question, but to thanks, with thanks to all who did ask such great questions, and thanks most of Thank all you to so you, Edith, for you. being yeah. such a great, great person to listen to. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.